Dean who? Don't fuck with me, Ronnie. But you know, Dean told me himself that you came by looking for work. You know what? You ain't shit, Ronnie. In the street and drug game, there's a certain set of unwritten rules and codes that you have to abide by. First rule, don't snitch. It's a fundamental principle in street culture. Don't talk about what doesn't directly involve you or concern you. Don't meddle in others' affairs and don't talk about what ain't yours. Kanan always hated people talking. As he said in power when he killed Jukebox, she was running her mouth. And you can certainly see where Kanan got his ruthlessness from, Ronnie Mathis. They're also building up this relationship between Duke and Kanan, where they have so much love for each other, but only for them to tear it down the way they did in power. It's heartbreaking, tragic, but also beautiful at the same time. But shit's real simple. Don't hear nothing, won't be nothing. You can avoid getting entangled in potentially dangerous situations by just minding your own business. Now, this also comes down to strategic thinking, planning, knowing your role, when to speak and when not to speak. Don't also move too fast. And all of these elements are going to tie into one as a central theme for this breakdown as we dissect a dark episode of Raising Kanan, Season 3, Episode 4. Episode 4 kicks off with one of Kanan's couriers being picked up by the feds, which is something I think we all knew was bound to happen. This courier system is very similar to what Ghost and Tommy used back in power, but the difference was, Ghost had couriers that could easily blend in with regular civilians, they had a different clientele, and they had a protocol and system in place. Of course, we do have to consider the error, but some of the principles still apply. Speed isn't always the best in certain situations. Moving too quick isn't always the best idea, because it can lead to errors and mistakes. In a high stakes game that they're in, that could make all the difference between getting caught, survival, and even death. Kanan also emphasized on the importance of direction and strategy. Speed also doesn't mean shit when you don't know where you're going. Simply put, moving too quickly without a clear direction and a well thought out strategic plan is pretty meaningless. Now not only does Kanan's words ring true when it comes to the street and drug game, but it also extends into the real world of business. It's why Ghost was so good at what he did. He was able to adapt and blend in with the elite by constantly adapting to meet everybody's expectations. But that's the difference between Ghost and people like Rock and Kanan. They accept who they are, they're born to move away, and they weren't changing for nobody. But as Rock made this quick business deal, she also found out moving fast without a clear strategy in terms of business isn't so easy, especially in a place like Queens with corrupt cops on your doorstep. So she met with Officer Buckley and Roland. They wanted to introduce themselves and let her know that they were there at her disposal, but no doubt, it would come at a price. Now, they were there throwing their weight around as men with a badge normally do, except they don't know who they're dealing with when it comes to Rock. As she told Unique in Season 1, she kneels for no man, and that also extends to cops. Now they also mention Kanan and how they did their background checks on Rock, and so of course that prompts Rock to go and check up on Kanan later on. So speaking of Kanan, he was at the precinct and he called Uncle Lou for help. The reason why he called Lou is because he's the only one who he can call at this moment in time. They both find themselves on the same page when it comes to Rock. So Kanan knew that Lou wouldn't say anything to his moms, but he isn't stupid either. He did help his nephew with Javon, but he warned him at the same time. He doesn't know what he's doing and I don't think he does want to know, but he can tell it ain't good. With Ronnie, we pick up with him meeting Ishmael Snaps Henry and Stephanie Pop Henry and it's clear that there is a lot of history here, but you saw this awkwardness because Ronnie's just that kind of awkward guy. He stood there emotionless and didn't even look at Pop as she was running her hands over his body, which does also make you ask the question whether he's into girls or not. When we talk about the inspiration behind Ronnie Mathis, he's such an enigma. It's the guy that you can't wrap your head around, the quiet guy, that all of a sudden you're like, whoa, where the fuck did that come from? It gets really scary real fast. Michael Myers was also a bit of the movement and inspiration, but when you think about psychopaths and inspiration from real life stories, another one that springs to mind is Jeffrey Dahmer, because I do think you can see a bit of him in Ronnie as well. As Ronnie was trying to get his own business up and running, Unique was trying to deal with his with Quan. Quan was questioning why isn't he moving much product, and we do have to remember the position that Unique is currently in. He's a lone wolf at this moment in time. He lost his entire crew at the end of season 2, so he's got no soldiers and no way to move his H. So it is going to take him a while, but as he said, Rome wasn't built in a day, and they can't move too quick because moving too quick would attract the wrong kind of attention, law enforcement. Which goes back to Kane's narration, Kane needs to slow down a bit, but that's the difference between him and Unique at this moment in time. Unique is a king, he's a strategist, he's a chess player, and he certainly knows the game. All he needs is a bit more time. 
Time and patience is exactly the approach Snaps was trying to tell Ronnie to take. He told him that he's always found you need to be reasonable and thoughtful, and if he's saying to sit tight, then he advises Ronnie to do just that. The problem is, Ronnie isn't exactly the patient type, especially because he knows Unique is keeping secrets. Now, on the flip side, yapping about who his brother is in bed with, I don't think that was such a good idea either, and it does make you think. He was doing the same shit as Dean did later, talking about other people's business. Information in the streets is very valuable, and I'm sure as many of you guys know, news travels fast, just like Pop said. They may be retired, but just because of who they are and what they've done in the streets, they do have people who keep them updated. Now, Ronnie was here because he was done waiting on Unique, and he needed a bit of cash to get his operation up and running. He also said that he made snaps a lot of money back in the day. So as I mentioned before, there is a lot of history in this room. So with them having a good working relationship in the past, Snaps said that he'll make a small investment. And that's the key word. The money that Snaps would give Ronnie would be an investment. With law enforcement, we saw Howard being approached by Special Agent Tanner and Detective Ogden from Queen's Narcotics. They told Howard that they were struggling with the fact that Crown Camacho was a real mastermind behind the drug operation at Baisley Park and the Jamaica houses. So let's not forget, this was a story that Howard, Rock and Lou all stuck to which the police brought in episode 1, but the feds have been doing a bit more digging. Now Howard sticks to the same story, Crown was paying people off to keep quiet. The most successful hustlers, the guys that are making the long money, they move quiet which is also a callback to season one. Dean kept his head down because the real kingpins, the ones making that long, long, long money, they ain't making noise. Howard also said that music was a new crack, which it was in the 90s. This was the hip hop era where a lot of drug dealers started record labels to clean their cash and find the next hit artist. But Ogden and Tanner kept their cards really close to their chest. They said that they had more thoughts than theories, which was also Howard's response to the question about his shooting. So Howard knows that he needs to tread very carefully by making sure he does cover his tracks because when it comes to the feds, they definitely have come to ruffle some feathers in season 3. Now speaking of the feds, something else which doesn't quite sit right with me is Gerald who works at The Voice. We saw Marvin going over to meet Gerald who works at The Voice as an editor. He mainly writes about culture, entertainment and also arts. But this is where Marvin needs to be very careful. He said that they could sit down and speak to each other about their problems. But again, who is Gerald Moore? He doesn't even know him apart from meeting him at his anger management classes in season 2. So just like Howard needs to be careful at the precinct, Marvin needs to make sure he doesn't give too much information to Gerald that could potentially come back and bite him because we are seeing more of a softer and a caring side to Marvin and sometimes when that happens, you can have a tendency to drop your guard. And so that brings me on to the relationship between Jukebox and Marvin. We see Jukebox going through a medical examination for the military which goes back to a signing so soon after Berk's death. But not long after, she gets the news that she did make the girls group. And it is nice to see Juke getting some good news for a change. She's been through a lot of heartbreak and trauma, so any small wins, you do have to celebrate, in a life which is mainly full of dark clouds. Now, Juke and Marvin are told that they have an experienced team and a formula for success. In the group, they've got their diva in Crystal, the girl next door in Aisha, and the tomboy, Jukebox. And the difference between this and season 2, when Juke was under Lou, they wanted Juke just to be Jukebox. They didn't want to change who she is, which Marvin made clear, this is who she is. Whereas with Lou and Crown, they wanted Juke to change her appearance to match the industry. But with that being said, Juke said let's do it, with Marvin in her corner. Now if things went right with the executive producers, they could have been in the studio in a few weeks and on tour as quick as three months. And so it was time to celebrate. Kanan takes her to a really fancy restaurant, reminding her that these are the small wins that they have to celebrate, which also goes for real life. We all get caught up in this working life, we forget to celebrate small wins, and sometimes we even forget to live. Now having said that, the love that these two characters have for each other at this moment in time is huge, and they really are building this up, but only to tear it down later on. Now what will contribute towards a broken relationship between the two later on, will be when Juke starts to tell Rock about Kanan's business, which also circles back around to the beginning, and one of the themes of this breakdown, just don't talk about anything that ain't yours to talk about. So there will be a huge moment that will start to fracture this relationship between Kanan and Juke. With Lou, nobody needed to tell him that he fucked up, he knows he did. But I think instead of going straight to Shirley's to apologise after his behaviour the night before, I think he should have visited his niece. This is the role reversal that we've been speaking about over the course of season 3. Not only is Lou on this downward spiral, but we've also got Marvin who's turned into Juke's biggest supporter, with Lou being the one who seems to be letting her down. Now with that being said, Marvin does let Lou know that the work that he did put in with Juke did come through and he might know a thing or two about music after all. He also wanted Marvin to come in on the hustle that he's got at Shirley's bar. 
His idea was the two could come together and give this place some spark, some young energy, and keep it a clean business away from the drug game and away from rock. There's also talks about setting up a studio at the back, and so you can really see Lou and Marvin bonding over Lou's vision for music, which again, isn't something we were used to seeing in the early seasons. The dynamic of the Thomas family has completely shifted now that we're three seasons deep, and where some family members are bonding, others are drifting like Rock and Kanan, but Rock isn't stupid, she knows exactly what she saw, and we've also seen what lengths she's gone to before to keep Kanan close, and so she set her eyes on her next move, the metal detectors. With Kanan and Famous, business was booming, the phones were ringing non-stop, orders were coming in thick and fast, and they were making bank, but their business was quickly interrupted by Paul. All of Paul's careers were either working for Kanan because he's paying them more, or they've bounced because they don't want to deal with weed. But this is another lesson that Kanan is having to learn. Sometimes to keep business running, you do have to pay people to keep their mouth shut. Now how long he can keep this up, who knows, I think at some stage Paul might become a problem and he may have to be moved out of the way, because it does seem like he does have a loud mouth. Now this is where we see Rock putting her plan into motion. She waits until Kanan is gone, and then she heads over to Famous's crib, but just before she did, we were given a reminder that she was still well and truly on the Fed's radar. She's still being watched wherever she goes, and at this moment in time, she does look like a regular civilian. But like we mentioned with Detective Howard, let's see what the Feds can dig up. Now just on a quick side note, as soon as Kanan was out the crib, Famous pulls the plug on the phone and says he's officially on vacation while working on his rhymes, which I think will become a big problem for Kanan in the long run. We all know they're entering a business where there are no days off, and I do feel like Famous will have to learn the hard way, and if he's rapping about him killing Freddy, just like he did with Streets Need a Body, then it definitely isn't going to end well for him. Now on Rock, she comes in and heads straight for Kanan's school bag and puts a gun inside while paying Famous to keep his mouth shut. This time around you can tell Famous didn't want to take the money, because this puts him in a really sticky situation. Unfortunately for Famous, Rock didn't really give him a choice. Now as Kanan walks through security, we see him getting pulled up on the gun that Rock planted in his bag. He has a handcuff slapped on his wrist and the principal calls Rock. Now this is very reminiscent to what we saw happen with Tariq St. Patrick back in power. Let's not forget he was also caught with a piece in his bag, but the difference is, Tariq took a gun in by choice, Kanan was set up by Rock, who really was at a manipulative best. She comes in and acts real surprised as if she didn't know what was about to go down. So as they sit down in the meeting with Dr. West, she reminds them of how their last meeting was very different to the current one. It was about Kanan enrolling as Stuyverson, which is a reminder how things could have played out very differently if Kanan did choose to go. She also explains how by law she is obligated to let law enforcement know about the seizure of a weapon, but someone seems to be looking out for Kanan at the police department, and we all know who that is, Detective Howard, very similar to how Angela was helping Tasha with the Tariq situation, but again, this does come back to the point of law enforcement. Howard needs to tread very carefully, because the feds are really digging deep, and if they start to make the right connections like Burke did, then next time Howard won't be able to shoot his way out of it. That's why he won't rock later on, the feds weren't messing around, but not only was Kanan's troubles on Rock, but the feds weren't buying her crown story. So all three, Rock, Kanan and Howard do need to be very careful on their next moves, because if there is one slip up, it really could be game over for one of them. Now it is going to be very difficult for Rock to contain and keep Kanan at home. We know if he violates his curfew then he'll find himself at juvenile court, but there is no way Rock can keep him inside. So this is going to be a huge problem for all of them, and Rock may have actually made matters worse just for another shot at this relationship. Another point is how is Kanan supposed to run his operation from Rock's house? He can't. So now he has to put more trust in Famous, who let's be real, hasn't got what it takes to hold down the operation without Kanan. So I wouldn't be surprised if this comes crumbling down sooner rather than later. Now over to Ronnie's next move, we saw him approach Dean at the bingo club and he gets straight down to business. He tells Dean that he's got a bit of money and he needs work, but Dean tells him that he's come to the wrong place. Not only was he out of business with South Jamaica, but he doesn't fuck with him or Unique, and maybe Unique was getting his product from Rocks Connect, the Colombians. Although Ronnie isn't the kind of guy you say no to, he does strike me as the guy who is always used to getting his way, and if he doesn't, he resorts to violence. With Dean, his bodyguard comes in and puts a gun to his stomach, but Ronnie isn't intimidated, he actually towers over Dean's bodyguard and it just adds to how scary he really is, along with everything else he does. Now with the rejection from Dean, we see Ronnie trying to get in with the Colombians, he catches them coming out of their restaurant and he tells them that he wants to make them some money, and if Unique's a problem, then they can figure that out. Problems always have solutions, but neither Joaquin and Juliana are having any of it, they reject Ronnie just like Dean did. Now with Unique, Vanessa questioned whether Unique was messing with any girls, because Ronnie mentioned that he may have had a side piece, 
And so we start to see how Ronnie is causing Unique a lot of trouble. And we haven't even got to his business yet. This is just his personal life. So we see Unique telling Rock, Ronnie is beginning to be a bit of an issue. He went to meet Dean about some work and how he must have spoken a whole lot of shit for Dean to hit Unique up about it. Now this also tells us that Rock does know about Ronnie being on the streets, which is something Unique may have told her off screen. But she definitely wasn't surprised, so she does know about Ronnie. She also clocked Unique's gun, which is a reminder for Rock. Both him and Unique are in different places at this moment in time. Unique's in the game and Rock's trying her best to stay out of it. So with Kanan coming back home, she told him that they have to press pause on what they had going on. So this was the last time. Now is it also coming to an end for Ronnie and Unique's relationship? Because you do feel at some point, something will have to give. Unique made it clear that he wasn't happy with what he did with Dean. But Ronnie's response was, Dean who? And he stuck to his story, despite Unique saying Dean told him directly. Which is where we heard Unique tell Ronnie, he ain't shit. And you could definitely tell, the fire really was burning inside Ronnie. If he wasn't thinking about killing Dean before, then he certainly was now for talking about his business and snitching to Unique. As Dean comes home with his grandma, he gives her her drink by going to the back to change the batteries in her hearing aid. Out the dark comes Ronnie with black gloves on, knife in hand and he grabs Dean. He stabs him multiple times while telling him he shouldn't have run his mouth and there goes Dean. Ronnie hated the fact that Dean was talking too much. In the streets you need to keep it simple. Don't hear nothing like grandma and don't snitch and there won't be any problems. But you can definitely see where the older Kanan got this from. And now Ronnie Mathis, he's gonna be a big problem on the streets.